had to sing, didn't you? <laughs> I didn't ask you to sing, did I? No, you had to sing. That was, that was very good. Now, if you picture a song done like that, with that kind of a visual, only at least that size in the sanctuary, so that you could really see the details. By the way, a lot of those scenes were Machu Picchu. I don't know if any of you've been there. But I showed this to Guy Beals, and he recognized where it was right away. Um, there'd be no words at the top, and there'd be no soloist singing the song. Some of those background voices where the women come in with some accents, that would be there. But the music itself would play, and then the choir would sing this. So if we had, in my wildest dreams and hopes, 15 to 20 people who would like to learn these songs, first of all, when we practiced, everybody would get a copy of the music, in just the music form, on a tape, so that you could take it home and listen to it continually. And if you need to go over songs 50 times to learn it, or five times, whatever, you could learn it that way. Uh, this is going to be great, especially for the kids, because they learn music, you know. How many of you were here to hear the band last week? Well, if you weren't here, you missed something. This is why you should never miss church, because we have our own band here that played last week beautifully. Uh, violins, a violin, guitars, and a piano. Um, and who's the oldest? Abby, you're the oldest kid, right? How old are you? Ten. Ten. Was great. Sure. And um, so, utilizing this kind of music means that when the choir stands up to sing, it's going to be Liam and Abby and Chloe and all the kids who want to sing, and plus the oldest people who are now in the choir. Everybody will be singing together. And everybody will be following the music that's on this tape, which they have heard over and over again. So if you can picture that, that's kind of the way this is going to look. But you have to be forgiving because there will be some fine-tuning that will happen. Like, maybe the video machine will cut out in the middle of things. You know how technology is. But I think as we fine tune this and learn how to do this, those of, when we do any kinds of accompaniment of songs that the choir would uh, ask you to join in on, you will have the sheet music, the, the notes and the words together uh, with you just as you do now. We're not going to replace words on a screen with a song from the song sheets here. Everybody will always have the song sheet. I know some of you want to read the song sheet, and so um, that will be there. Now I'm going to get into your brains. I know you brought them with you today. So I want to talk about something which I've been thinking about for a while, and I want to share this with you. Right brain, left brain, you've all heard of this, I think. And probably most of you are dominantly left brain. Uh, most of us are. There are very few people who are dominant right brain people. Most of us are left brain people. And if you notice on the chart here, left brain uh, dominates the right side of, the, of your body. These are temporal relations. Uh, this is a linear sense of time. You know, time goes from now till minutes, hours, weeks. It's, and it's laid out literally, lin linearly. So if you think about your time, you think about it on a calendar, right? Your time is measured on a calendar. And th so that's the kind of thinking you do on the left side of your brain. This is the analytical side, the logical side. Some abstract thinking happens. You think of things in sequence. For instance, uh, the simplest res uh, idea of sequence thinking is recipes. You, you do a recipe, you have to do it in sequence. I have no idea because I can't cook anything unless it comes out of a can. But for those of you who are really cooks, you know, you have to do this stuff sequ uh, sequentially. This is, the think this is the thinking about cause and effect. Like, um, if I reach under this barn to see what animal's living under there, I may get bit, right? Cause and effect. Uh, speech is is uh, controlled on this side, your sense of grammar, naming things. You know, when um, we get older, and it's happening to me more and more, um, I'm losing names, you know. So the left side of my brain must be ready to go on vacation already. Um, math is on this side, and trained music is on this side. So if, you, if you've learned uh, an instrument or you were trained in music, reading music, that's on the left side of the brain. So. If you were trying to put labels on this, this is 
the logician, the critic, the analyst. This is all left brain thinking. Now here's the right brain side. Uh, this dominates the left side of the, of the body. Spatial relationships are here. Do you know anybody who can't tell, you hold up two objects and they can't tell which one is larger? You know anybody like that? Or people look at a car and say, wow, that's, that, that's the same size as your car, and that car is either much bigger or much smaller. Some people are very good with spatial relationships, others are not. If, for instance, you are a builder or a painter or something like that, you have a very strong sense of spatial relationships. You keep everything in the right proportion. Um, simultaneous time sense, keros is the Greek word for this. This means that while you, when you think about time, you can mingle a whole bunch of things together. You can think about memories of people who've gone by. You can think of yourself in that period of time. You can think about yourself today. And you can think into the future. And all this kind of melds together for you. You don't, have you ever, some, sometimes you're doing something that's kind of timeless. Um, I've told you this example. The only example I can think of for myself is playing softball. I'm in the outfield. A guy hits a long fly ball. I'm running after it. It's timeless. I'm 20 years old again. I'm running with my head down. It's beautiful. Of course, I can't get to the ball because my legs are saying, what the heck are you doing? We're waiting for you to stop. But that's a timeless kind of thing, and you probably have those senses. Um, sometimes at worship, uh, I think people, the Holy Spirit kind of gives us the sense that we're part of something that's very big, and there's no time attached to it. Um, the, the thinking is a synthetic meaning that a lot, lots of different kinds of thinking you're able to push together and make a whole lot of stuff that otherwise seems to be separate. Um, this is art, music, untrained music, drawing, depth perception, complex visual patterns, all of this stuff, gestures and facial expressions, gestalts our experiences, dreaming, ESP meditation, and the names put to this would be artists inventor, and innovator. These two things are supposed to work together in balance. I would bet, if I had to bet my paycheck, which Joyce just gave me, that nobody here is in balance. We are all almost, not exclusively, but most of the time, on the left side of the brain. So when people have uh, visions or they have ideas about some things, uh, it often takes us a long time to figure out what they're really talking about because we want to be on the analysis side. Show me the blueprints. Show me the outline. And that's not right brain kinds of thinking. I want, here's a story that, it, that explains some of this, and I think I've told you this before, but it fits into this idea very well. In the year 1870, the Methodists in Indiana were having their annual conference. At one point, the president of the college where they were meeting said, I think we live in a very exciting age. The presiding bishop said, what do you see? And the college president responded, I believe we are coming into a time of great inventions. I believe, for example, that people will fly through the air like birds. The bishop said, this is heresy. The Bible says that flight is reserved for the angels. We will have no such talk here. After the conference, the bishop, whose name was Wright, went home to his two small sons, Wilbur and Orban. <laughs> it's a great story, because most of us would say, the guy's talking about flying over here. It's 1870, five years after the end of the Civil War. But clearly, uh, Orville and Wilbur did a lot of right-brain thinking. They were, well, what's possible here? What could we do? I was at a workshop um, at a Methodist church, as a matter of fact, in Virginia several years ago, and we did this exercise. I'm going to do the exercise with you, but you just have to use your imagination. Okay. You're all partnered up. So you look at the person across the table for you, that, from you, that's your partner. Now you're all invited to stand and face each other, and then this is what you're told. Turn around, put your back to your partner, and change three things about yourself about your appearance, 